Push back in session. Yes, ma'am. Now proceeding to figure six in your report. Could you please explain? Would you please explain this? Figure? Sure. At 5:13 and 56 seconds p.m., 615-606-4119, uh, the Roy Coons Jr. Uh, device has an outgoing voice call. The duration, uh, there's no duration. And the handset is communicating with that same tower as before, but uh, sector 23, which is uh, facing a southerly western direction. And the uh, crime scene of Johanna Ortega would not be consistent with being in that zone of coverage? That's correct. At 7.31 and 14 seconds p.m., that same device makes an outgoing voice call to 615-268-5339. Uh, duration is 50 seconds. And, and who is that call to? Uh, I've got it listed as Roy Coon Sr. Okay. And, and you don't know if it's to the person, but it's just the device. The device that uh, I was advised that associated with. Yes, ma'am. Uh, communicating with T-Mobile's site ID 27225 Sector 1. Say that again. Uh, it was communicating with T-Mobile LTE site ID 27325 Sector 1. And the, uh, the I guess it's pinkish color or is that red pinkish color uh, diagram there. Is that representing the zone of coverage for the device uh, associated with Roy Coons Jr. or Roy Coons Sr.? Junior. Junior? Device, yes, ma'am. And the device for Roy Coons Sr. is not depicted. <coughs> It'll be on the next page of the report. And going back to that, that zone of coverage would be consistent with um, covering the area of the crime scene. That's so correct. And that is at 731? That's correct. And Roy Coon Sr., this is his device, the tower and sector that it was using off of Bri this Bradley Parkway, um, Opry Mills Mall is in this area. And this would be the other side of that phone call? Correct. The previous that would, figure? That, that's correct. Now looking at figure number nine. At 744. In 29 seconds p.m., Roy Coon Sr. makes an outgoing voice call. Duration is 8 minutes and 38 seconds. It's communicating with uh, this LAC and SID or location area code and cell identity is what those acronyms stand for. Let me zoom in there so you can see a little bit better the area we're talking about. So here we have Lebanon, Lebanon Pike, uh, McGavick. But it would not be consistent with being in the zone in the of cover that would cover um, for our crime scene. That's correct, no ma'am. It would not be consistent with that area. In fact, at the very top up here, if I can zoom out, that um, part on the map that you indicated with the Walmart, would that be here? That's correct, yes ma'am. So the crime scene in this case would be further to the north. Further north, yes ma'am. At 7.57 and 9 seconds p.m., uh, Drexel Cleveland's device, the 615-969-8332, uh, has an incoming voice. Uh, duration is two seconds, and it's communicating again with the tower in the Millersville, Tennessee area. Verizon Tower 546, Sector 4. And the other individual whose records you received uh, associated... Um, with the device assigned to Tyler Sloan, 
was there any activity on that phone um, using, utilizing cell towers? Not during that time frame that I looked at from 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. on the 10th. No, ma'am. Could you please explain what figure 11 is showing? Uh, so, again, I mentioned earlier about pattern of life um, issues. It can be very beneficial in an investigation. Which towers uh, that an individual handset will use the most, this is what that is indicating, uh, that the uh, this, uh, device used this handset or this uh, power and sector uh, for the entire data set that I was provided uh, use this the most. And then the who he's calling and how often the text messages and voice calls frequency uh, just shows kind of a, an indicator of who, who he's calling or who that person's receiving calls from and making calls to and texts to. Now, I do this for all four of the devices. Um, this is uh, the Roy Kuhn Senior's device, the 268-5339. Um, it's most frequently used tower and sector for that device during the, uh, time, the entire time frame uh, presented <coughs> and the most frequent voice calls, contacts. Tyler Sloan's device, uh, most frequently used sector and tower. Um, and if I can zoom in, you might be able to tell a little bit better geographically where that was. Sure. So in Smyrna, this is uh, I 24, uh, Murfreesboro Road, Old Fort Parkway, if you're familiar with that area. Um, <coughs> it's a cell tower right off of Murfreesboro Road. This is showing the frequencies of his call as well? Correct. And then moving to figure 14. This is Drexel Cleveland's handset. Again, the most frequently used uh, tower and sector for his device through the whole data set provided and the most frequently contacted other uh, contacts in his records. And his most frequently utilized tower would be the one there, That's correct. Okay. And what do we have in this last section here? This is just a continuation from the page before. I listed uh, Verizon sends a separate uh, spreadsheet that has the text message activity. Verizon and Sprint, you will not get tower activity. Even though it's going through the network and going through the tower, you won't be able to see. They don't report that information out. Uh, what that uh, tower is that we use to utilize during that text transmission. Um, but I listed these because I um, didn't know if it would be important in the investigation, only because that spreadsheet is separate from the actual CDR. So those are the text messages during that 3 p.m. to 8 p.m. time frame. And actually, speaking as to that point, is your information about the um, direction of the investigation somewhat limited when you're doing your analysis? Correct. And I can have the exhibit back just for one moment, Your Honor. I could, I'm going to flag two pages for you, and actually two little spots on there. And for the record, it's going to be page 17 of your report and page 19 of your report. If you would um, look at those two pages at the line right above where the um, post-it note is. Yes. Okay, and then on page 19 as well. Correct, yes. Okay, um, on there you have, uh, I think, one number, but it's associated with 
these with two different names? Sure. Yes, this is a mistake or a typo. Okay, can you and, and can you just explain what that is and maybe make the correction on the sure. report? Sure. So on page 17, it should have been the 606 phone number associated with Roy Coons Jr. and not Tyler Sloan. Okay. So. And if you could, just so that we'll have that clear on the um, actual report. Oh, you have a pen? You, if you could just make that correction, okay, sure. and then we'll show the jury. Again, it, it should have listed, it should have been 615 606 4119 instead of the 766 number. Okay. And then going to the next page, which is uh, page 19, and is that the correct That's number? The correct number. That's the correct number. That's correct. That's correct. And that's because, again, the information you provided in the report, it is not concrete. That's correct. And when I get the report, I'm going to ask you some questions about some of those lines. But basically, a tower will only pick up a handset if that handset is in use. That's correct. And when I say in use, it has to be using that particular network, correct? Correct. There are third-party apps whereby one can use Wi-Fi or, uh, I guess, 4G that may or may not show up as a hit on the tower. That's correct. Um, some of those applications could be things like Google Voice. Correct. Uh, WhatsApp. That's correct. Kick. Correct. Any of those devices where one can make phone calls but still not be detected on a particular cell tower. That's correct. And so when we do this report, when you do this report, we talk about calls that were or were not made. We don't know if the handset was in use for other purposes. That's correct. And that's not something you looked at. It's not something that we're able to get from the provider. All right. Um, and why, why can't you get that information? AT&T is the only provider that provides data uh, transactions. The other providers don't provide that. The apps that you mentioned are apps that will run over data. Or if you're connected to Wi-Fi, that's not going through the network at all. It's going through a local Wi-Fi network. So if you're using an app that's using data, Google Voice or Kick or WhatsApp, it's using the data portion and will ride above the network and will not be in a, it will not be a voice, even though it could be a voice transaction, it's not going to be listed as a network voice transaction, but rather a data transaction. And most of the providers do not provide that information other than AT&T. Let me ask you about the information. So your report is based entirely on information that is generated by the telephone companies. That's so correct. Yes, sir. Uh, that's not independent data that is generated by Metro. Police. That's correct. No, sir. And when you receive that information from practically every carrier, doesn't it come with some disclaimers? Uh, it gives instructions on how to read it. but. Does it give you any disclaimer such as this is not to be relied upon for exact, precise location? Correct. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. What, other, what other disclaimers does it give like that? That's, that would be the only one that I know of. Well, explain that disclaimer. So the disclaimer is uh, it, it, I'm not, and the cell phone company is not saying that the device is in a very specific, a specific location. And just like my report, I explained that I'm only saying that the handset is communicating with this particular tower at this particular space at this particular uh, time. Okay, well, I've got on the uh, overhead now, it looks like it's page 8 of your report. Correct. 
And this is a telephone call regarding a phone handset associated with Drexel Cleveland at 3.18 p.m. Correct. And I want to direct your attention to this, this area here. Make sure I'm running the report. This area here, there's a, there's a pretty straight line that comes off this V. And that would be, when you talk about a sector, this is what you're referring to, correct? That's the visual representation of the sector that that handset is communicating with. That's correct. But this actual tower sector, it is not a clean, direct, 120-degree line on no, either sir. direction. No, sir. If you, no. If you actually looked at the radio propagation of the sector, it would, would not look like with the clean lines at all. No, sir. Well, well, for example, on this one, what would it actually look like? You could draw on the monitor. Sure. If you, and I'll explain it. And just like they explained to us in training, if you took jello and threw it up on a wall, it would very much look like that. So the actual radio propagation of a cell sector would more, and I'm not saying that this is the actual propagation of that. I draw this, but um, it would maybe look more like this, but still in that general direction, but very, just not sporadic, but just an amoeba looking, like I said, if you threw jello up on the wall. Uh, there might be some actual open pockets out here, but just that general area. So, were that line on your chart here, for example, and you can clear that. So on your, your chart here, you're not saying that this is an exact representation of where these lines are, and therefore that call had to generate within this perfectly shaded, fan-shaped area. That's correct, and I go into detail on that in the report. Yes, sir. Okay, well, you didn't mention on your direct, so that's why I wanted to make it clear for the jury. I, I, I thought I did. I, if not, I'll say it again. It's not to keep or restrain the... Uh, cell tower or the handset within the pie shape. And this outer line, which would be, it looks like a, a part of the circumference of a circle, but the outside line, it's, it's equally not uniform. Correct. And a handset could be further this direction and still be communicating with this tower. That's correct. And even if there are closer towers, it may still be communicating with this one due to things like network overload, the time of day, things like that. Yes, sir. And in fact, the time of day that we're looking at, for example, on this one, 318, that's getting close to the peak time for this particular carrier, is it not? That's correct. Because it's, you know, people leaving work, going to work, ship change, things like that. These towers tend to get overloaded. Correct. So in this time of day that's in question, it could certainly, you know, be further away from the tower than normal or closer than normal because of the time, it's just because of the time of day. The load shifting, yes, sir. Right, load shifting, that's right. Yes, sir. So with load shifting, you would expect that this may not be, the phone may not necessarily even be within the shaded portion of this map. Exactly, yes. Right. Now, how far is it from this tower here that you've identified uh, on page 8 of your report to 1229 Old Dickerson Pike? Uh, just an estimate, somewhere between 8 to 10 miles. Eight and that's just, miles. that's just a guess. Okay, 8 to 10 miles. Time. Yes, sir. And that is by, when you say to 10 miles, we're talking about how long it would take to drive from that location down I-65 to that location. Possibly, yes, sir. No, sir. And, of course, I'm not going to hold you to 8 to 10 miles. Right, and that, that's just a guess. So, roughly, and if you were driving speed limit on I-65, you were talking maybe 10, 15 minutes to get from Millersville, that, look, that tower, back down here. Well, at that time of day, again, getting into the rush hour mm -hmm. period, it might take longer just because of that traffic load on the interstate. Do you know if anyone's done any research into the traffic flow that particular no, day? No, I have not. PDOT cameras or anything like no, that? No, So when we're talking about Drexel Cleveland's head handset, since you said it only hits a tower if it's in use, you can only tell where a handset was in relation to a tower when it's either receiving or sending call to text message. That's correct. So, for example, on this one, page 8, there's a call at 3.18.09. And when was the next one, I'm sorry, that Drexel Cleveland's telephone rang? Uh, I believe it's that one at 448. Yes, sir. So there is no activity on that particular phone for one hour and 30 minutes and a few seconds. That's correct. And again, it's you don't know where that handset was in between that time. That's correct. And that's true of all the handsets. That's correct. Yes, sir. So, for example, on Mr. 
Coons phone, there was a, looks like on page nine of your report, uh, the handset associated with Mr. Coons, it says that there was a call at 258 and another one at 432. That's correct. So during that period of time, you have no way of knowing where that handset was. That's correct. And again, the shaded area here, um, it's not an exact... Right, it's not to limit, right. right, it's not to limit where that handset possibly could be. Do you have any idea, like, for example, from the point of the tower to 1229, what that actual distance is? Less, less than half a mile. Less than half a mile? Or right around a half a mile, yes, okay. sir. So, so if it's a half a mile from this tower to that site, then if you were to draw the circumference around, maybe a math problem here, about how far would it be, for example, over to this area on the edge of your left-hand line from 1229 to your If you can, if you can estimate. Oh, I don't. I, I, as far as the square mileage, the so, area. Well, uh, not the mileage. Just if we know it's a half mile from here to here. Right. So from here, for example, here, how far would that be? Maybe a mile or less. Yeah, probably about a mile. Yes, sir. I would. Okay. I'd give you that. And so, if someone is over in this area, you could actually be hitting either this sector or. In this sector because that line runs about right here. Correct. So it's possible that all of the calls were made on his phone in the time in question from the one location because we don't know if it was this sector or this sector or if he was somewhere in this gray area here. That's correct. So he may not have even been at 1229 Dickerson Pike at the time that we're talking about. It's possible. Yes, sir. The telephone numbers that are referenced for any of the, the four handsets in question, is, there's, when you say there was an incoming call or an outgoing call, you, you reference in your report that actual number. Correct. Uh, and I'm not talking about the handset number, but the number that was either calling the handset in question or that was called by the handset. Correct. Yes, sir. Do you know, did you follow up on any of those telephone numbers to see I, who they belong to? I did not, no, sir. Did you follow up on any of those, do you know if they were followed up on to see if people actually had conversations and what those conversations were about? I did not, no sir. Did you get the records for any of those phone numbers to see where they were located at the time that they were either making calls to or getting calls from any of these four hands? I did not, no sir. Would that not have been your responsibility? That would not have been my responsibility. That would have been on the detective in the case? Correct. You were just running the information that you were requesting? That's correct. And finally, the obvious question is, you, you've said, you've used the word handset a lot. And handset refers typically to a cell phone. Cell phone, the actual device being used, yes, sir. And so these locations, when you put names in this report, you're not saying that any of the people on these handset actually made or received the phone calls. That's correct. So that the, the name in these reports would just be for reference purposes? Reference purposes only. And they were the names that I was given by Detective Hill. Okay. Uh, did you actually, well, so... Whoever was making these calls, you can't say just that the handset itself made the call. That's correct. That's all. all right. No other questions. Right. No, Your Honor. Thank you. Next one. Anthony Hinton. <clears throat> Your Honor, Mr. Hinton is a little... Uh, hard of hearing. Okay. It might be best if I just stand right next to him for his direct examination, if that's okay with the court. Sure. If, if that's necessary, sure. We'll try it from here and see how it goes. And then... Stand right here, basically, and raise the right hand. Okay. Do you swear to tell the truth, I'll help you guys? Mr. Hinton, can you hear me okay? Would it be better if I stand next to you? Let me try coming over here and see how we do. Can you hear me now okay? Yes. 
Go ahead and state and spell your first and last name. Anthony Hinton. Go ahead and spell both both your first. Oh, names. both of them. Yep. A N T H O N Y H I N T O N. Mr. Hinton, where do you work? For Hillview Acres. And is Hillview Acres a, a, a mobile home or trailer home park located at 1229 Old Dickerson? Yes. What is your job at that trailer park? I am a park manager. Are you the only manager there? Yes. What does the manager do? Uh, basically, I take care of the grounds. I uh, uh, sell homes, uh, fix up places that for sale, uh, accept the lot rent, make out the lot leases, uh, just anything that needs to be done on the grounds. How long have you been doing that job? Been there since November of uh, 2015. So you would have been doing that same job in August of 2017? Yes. Did you know someone named Roy Kuhn Sr. who lived in lot C4? Senior? Yes. Yes. Did you know Roy Coons Jr.? No. Had you ever met him? No. Did you know he was living at that location? No. Did you ever tell Roy Coons Sr. that he needed that Roy Coons Jr. needed to move out because he was not on the lease? No, because I wasn't aware. Right. Did you ever tell, I know it's a little repetitive, but did you ever tell Roy Coons Jr. that he needed to move out? No. Have you ever spoken with Roy Coons Jr.? If I have, it would just been a hand at passing. Uh, now, this is under the assumption that uh, the guy that I'm thinking of is the one that used to help uh, Mr. Coons watch his car outside. I, I, at the time, the C-16 was vacant, and I would mow that yard. And sometimes Mr. Coons and someone else was outside uh, washing a car, and I would throw my hand up, being, being polite. If you were going to basically try and kick a tenant out because they were not on the lease, what would you have to do in order to do that? To uh, if, someone that's on the lease? If someone is not on the lease and you find out that they're living in a trailer, what would you have to do in order to get that? I would have. Move? I'm sorry. I would have to approach the uh, the uh, resident at that address, and uh, I would. They would be responsible for removing uh, that person uh, from the resident uh, they would they would be the one that would be in violation of our lot lease agreement okay so I would have to I the would have resident to. not the person who's there is not supposed to be there right correct it would be the leaseholder you would approach excuse me it would be the leaseholder you would approach not the illegal tenant correct and is that because of basically the laws that Revolve around landlord right. tenant type law. Tennessee by Tennessee law, uh, I wouldn't if someone wanted their son-in-law out of their house. The only way I could get them out of their house and and farewell them too would be to evict the whole family. Right. I would have had to have evict uh, the whole family. And they would have to remove their home or sold their home. Just out of curiosity, how tall are you? How tall? Mm -hmm. uh, six, seven, three quarters. Okay. Bear with me for one second, okay? I could get one from right here. It's fine. Okay. Um, did you ever? 
Did you sometimes mow the lawn at lot C2? Uh, yes, the, uh, when they came in and done their lot lease agreement, they asked me if I, uh, who, who maintained the lawns. And they asked me if uh, I would mind uh, doing it for a few weeks until they could get, until they could get a mower or, or make other arrangements. And so that would be after that, right after they moved in, right? Two years prior. Excuse me. Two years prior to the 2017 that we're talking about, when they moved in, or around there. Uh, from the time that uh, they had moved in until uh, a few weeks. Okay. So after prior that, to them leaving. so after that few weeks, well, what? Do you are you do you have any personal knowledge of who started cutting their lawn after they didn't use you anymore? Uh, after the fact, but not after, you don't have any personal knowledge of it. No, I, I was I was uh, told that uh, they had found somebody to do it for for fifteen dollars a time. Those are all mine. One moment. On August 10th of 2017, did you go up and knock on the door at Trailer C2? August of... Do you remember the day that the police came when the 12-year-old when the girl was killed in C2? Yes. Did you knock on the door of that trailer that day? No. Those are all my questions. Sorry, right, Cross. Yeah, Cross. Mr. Hinton, how many lots do you have there at uh, Hillview Acres? Uh, 84. 84. And in August of 2017, do you know if they were all leased? No. You don't know or they were not all leased? They were not all leased. Do you know how many tenants you had at that time? Uh... Talking about total or how many households? How many households? Uh, I had uh, approximately 77. So just about fully leased at that time. Now, yes. is there, are there any surveillance cameras that you know of that your management keeps in place there at the mobile home park? Just on the front front door of the office. Okay. And where is the office in relation to lot C2? It's on the opposite street. So there would be nothing from that surveillance camera that would capture nope. anything happening there? Are most of the homes there single-wide trailers or double-wide trailers? Uh, most of them are single. And these single wide trailers have relatively thin walls, do they not? Uh, no, the our uh, our uh, mobile home community has the newer model, mostly newer model homes, and they have standard uh, uh, two by four walls like a home. Some even uh, two by six even. Did you know the previous occupant of Lot C2, Mr. David Love's, uh, David Love Sr.? Did you ever meet him? No. Had he passed away about the time you started working there? Uh, that, that's my understanding. Okay. Do you know when uh, Ms. Velasquez moved in to Lot C2? Uh, no, I, could, I couldn't recall right offhand. Do you know if it was in 2015 or could it have been 2016? Uh, it would have to be, I would say it would have to be uh, 16. Okay. And you mentioned that for a while you helped her keep her yard mowed. Uh, yes, a few weeks. A few weeks. So that would have been in the summer of 2016, I guess, since grass is not growing in the wintertime, right? 
What's that? You didn't mow the grass in the winter time. No. So it would have been the summer of two thousand sixteen. If, uh, if I'd done any maintenance in the winter time, it would be to clean up leaves, okay. just mulching up leaves for somebody. Okay, but you don't recall doing that at lot C two. Did you ever have occasion to go knock on the door at C2 for anything? Uh, I was only there ever one time. Uh, they had a truck, a uh, truck that was for sale, large four by four pickup truck. Uh, my son was getting ready to start looking for a vehicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son and I come up and uh, knock on the door. Do you recall when that was? I'm sorry, I, I don't. It's fine. Um, did you ever ever have any uh, problems with excessive cars or noise or anything from Lot C2? I never, never knew when they would come and go. It, it was very quiet, very polite. And what was your understanding of who, how many people lived in Lot C2? My understanding was uh, father, mother, and I think three girls, three daughters. Maybe. That was my understanding. So, just so we're clear, mother, father, and three daughters. With, without checking records, I think. I know they had at least three daughters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And your understanding was that the father lived there as well? Uh, yes. I... And was he the one that was selling this big truck you went and looked at? Yes. Is he the one you spoke with there at that residence about it? Uh, he was not there at the moment. Uh, one of the daughters answered the door. And she called him, and my son and I waited outside until he was he was just right up the street, I think. And he pulled up within 10 minutes, and and uh, we talked about the truck. But you didn't end up buying the truck? Excuse me? Did you end up buying the truck? No. no. What other cars, if any, did you notice parked there at C2 besides this big truck? Uh... They had a, a car that I don't recollect the make and model of. And uh, I think they owned uh, an SUV. Okay. Any other cars that you can remember being there? No, I no, nothing that... Uh... Did you ever see who ended up cutting their yard after you stopped doing it? No. How often would you go through the, the neighborhood there as manager? Daily? Weekly? Oh, daily. On, on site. Okay. You, you live there yourself? That's correct. So you would have... But you but you never actually saw who cut the yard after you? That's that's correct. I, uh, you just noticed the I yard do was do cut. The, I do, uh, I do main, mold the whole front of the... All the way across the front of the property. And... Uh, but I also have uh, all the empty lots, the seven, you know, that was empty at the time, plus uh, the, the field in the middle of the property. So, you know, I was always running through there, but. Okay. You, but you, if, there, if their yard hadn't have been mowed, you would have noticed and probably said you need to mow it. I would have mowed it. I, if I seen it hadn't been mowed, I would have known it at least after a couple of three days. Cause. Now, you as manager are not responsible for maintaining the inside of these individual homes, correct? No. That's something the resident has to do themselves. That's correct. And do you know who was, was there any one particular person that did maintenance in that area? Or was it just a, you just didn't know? I, I don't know who performed maintenance on their own. And to your knowledge, you, you never had a conversation with anyone known as Roy Coons Jr. As far as I recollect, I, 
I, I would know. That's all, Your Honor. Redirect? No redirect, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, the next witness would be Madge Green. Good afternoon, Ms. Green. Good afternoon. If you could, please state your first name and your last name and spell them for the court reporter. Madge, M-A-D-G-E, Green, G-R-E-E-N. And Ms. Green, um, back in August of 2017, where were you living? At Hillview Acres Mobile Home Park. Can you pull that microphone down just a little bit for you? There we go. Okay. okay. Speak up loud for us so we we'll make sure the jury can hear you. Okay. okay. Um, you said that you lived at the Hillview Mobile Home? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And how long, uh, when did you first move in there? Uh, 2014. At which particular lot were you living? Uh, C9. Okay. And, Your Honor, um, if we could have the exhibit, um, it's one of the very first ones. Uh, the one that shows the trailer park code. Showing you what is marked as Exhibit 2B. Okay. And actually, it would make it easier for me to start with this. If I could hand Exhibit 2B to you. And to ask you if you can look at it, and if you recognize, you look like you might need your glasses. Are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> can you tell from that um, from that aerial photograph whether or not you can see where you were living back in August of 2017? Yes. Okay. And if I could have a pen handed to you, and if you could just put your initials MG um, kind of on top of where your home was. Let's see this one right here. Okay. And if I could have that exhibit back. That's easier than making you have to look at it up there on the screen and find it. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. And would this be one of the front entrance ways into the um, park area? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember on the night of, or probably the afternoon, evening hours of August the 10th, 2017, an incident happening down by lot C2 near the entrance? Yes. That had police there? Yes. And would that have been in this area right here? Yes. So this would be your home, and this would be the area where the police activity was? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. 
screen, can you kind of ex uh, describe just a little bit kind of how your um, your home is designed, uh, the door, the uh, if whether or not you have any type of porch or coverings? I have a, a, a deck, a porch covered. Okay. And I face the wooded area. Okay. Behind. Your front door looks out into that wooded tree line. Correct. So you, the back of your home would be to the roadway. Correct. Okay. And when you're talking about the porch and the covering, what type of covering is that? Uh, it's a, a aluminum or metal awning okay. over a wood deck. Okay. And does it go, is it kind of come off of where your roof line would be? Yes, ma'am. Um, now, going back to um, around the time of 2017, did you know an individual by the name of Roy Coons, Jr.? Yes. And did you know his father and his mother? Uh, yes. Okay. Did Roy Coons Jr. ever do any type of maintenance or work around your home? Yes, he did. Can you kind of describe that for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Uh, he removed some shrubs, okay. him and his father. And um, Roy Jr. pressure washed and bleached my patio and my awning underneath. <laughs> and... Uh, then he did some caulking to where the awning meets the trailer. Okay. Up at the roof line area? Up at the roof line area on top and underneath. Okay. And the purpose of doing that caulking was for what? To keep it from leaking. It was leaking in between where it was connected to the trailer. Now, your porch area, do you have to take up some steps to get up to your porch? Just two little steps. Okay. And about how far off the ground is your porch? Um, maybe two feet. Two feet? Yeah. And then that would beat up about where the level of the floor of your home would yes. be? Yes. Yes, ma'am. So that awning would be at the top of that first story of your home? Yes, ma'am. And it was that awning where it meets the roof line where the caulking Correct. Stuck. Would that caulking, um, when, do you remember when you asked Mr. Coons to do that caulking? Uh, it was probably in July. I asked him to clean the porch and seal it and um, clean the lattice and mm -hmm. the roof. And uh, after he did that, he said that he would caulk uh, because it leaks down behind the, where it meets. Right. And uh, so he said he'd get to it next time he could. Okay. Now, I want to ask you just very briefly. Um, first of all, not asking you where you were, but um, at that time, were you working? Yes. And about how many hours a week were you working? Uh, I was on overtime at that time. Okay, so. you were working quite a bit? <laughs> yes. Okay. And if you weren't at work, were you pretty much at home? Yes, ma'am. Did you have anyone that lived there with you? Yes, I have a roommate. Okay. Um, when you were at home, did you ever have an opportunity to see or meet or notice your neighbors at Lot C2? No. Okay. Did you ever um, see children playing out in the front yard of Lot C2? No, ma'am. Um, did you ever see any police activity or disturbances at Lot C2 other than the night we're talking about? No, ma'am. Now, going to um, the day of August 10th of 2017, did you work? Yes, ma'am. What time did you get home? I got home about 5 to 5. Mm -hmm. And when, when you pulled in, which entranceway did you come in? The one by Lot C or the other one? The one by Lot C. Okay. The, yeah, the first one from okay. Dickerson Road. Okay. <laughs> so you pull into your neighborhood, and do you go immediately home? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, do you immediately get out and go into your home? Normally, I do. Okay. But on this occasion, on August 10th, did you? <coughs> I did. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury why. Uh, when I drove up and was going to turn in my cove, I saw uh, two ladies in red t -shirt, red shirts and khaki pants. So I thought they were salesmen, and I didn't want to talk to them. So I drove on around and went out, drove around the block, and came back. And um, when you got back, were they still in the immediate vicinity? They were still in my cove. <laughs> <laughs> so did you um, decide to sit in your car and make a call to your to a relative? Yes, ma'am, I did. Okay. Do you know how long that phone call lasted? Uh, probably about five minutes. When you got through with your phone call, was it safe for you to be able to get away from the salespeople and get Yes, home? they had gone to another trailer. <laughs> okay. And when you got inside, what did you do? 
I went in and put my lounge clothes on okay. and turned on Jeopardy. Is that one of your favorite shows? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, when you were in there getting ready and watching um, Jeopardy, did you have any visitors come? Yes. And who was your visitor? Uh, Roy Jr. Okay. And when Roy Jr. arrived, did he um, knock on your door? Yes, ma'am. And you opened the door? Yes, ma'am. And could you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about your conversation with him? Uh, he wanted to tell me that he had been up there to do the caulking. And so we went out on the porch, and he showed me what he did up on top, that he got up on top and caulked it from the top, and then he showed me from the bottom that he had caulked it. And I said, well, it looks real good. <laughs> I can't see the caulking. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, had you noticed the caulking before that day when he pointed it out? No, no. Okay. And uh, so um, we stood there and talked for a few minutes and um, about how he'd done my porch and we were going to do my patio. And uh, so I went on in and got the money. We finished talking. I went in and got the money to pay him, and he left. Do you know about, um, is there anything about that day to give you an idea about what time you were having your conversation with Mr. Coons, Jr.? Uh, it was probably about 5 .05, 5.07 to probably about 5.20. Okay. And is that an estimate just based on the fact you had the Jeopardy show on? Yes, and they were finishing up Double Jeopardy. When he left, it was finishing Double Jeopardy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, um, when you saw... Um, all the times that you've seen Mr. Coons Jr. working on mm -hmm. your home or being out and about, have you ever seen him with any type of physical disability or problems with moving? No. Around? Okay. Now, did the police on um, on August the 10th, did they come by your house and knock on the door? No. Canvassing? No, ma'am. Did you at some point talk to police? Uh, I had gone out to get my roommate, okay. pick her up. At, I left at 9.30, and that's when I saw. Okay, same that was day. the same day. Same day. That's the first time you saw the activity? Right. Okay. And so I picked her up at the bus stop, and we came straight home. And when I pulled mm -hmm. in my cove to park, I saw a police officer walking down the back <laughs> fence line. Okay. And I asked him, I said, is there anything we need to be worried about? And he said, no, just go on inside. Okay. Now, did you at some later time have an opportunity to speak with police officers? And not asking what you said right now, but did you talk to yes. them? Yes. And did you cooperate with them? And yes. Give the information you've told the ladies and gentlemen of the jury here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, did you, well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you have, um, do you have a sister-in-law whose husband is a detective? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, did you ever tell Roy Coons Jr. that your sister-in-law's husband was a detective? No. Did you ever tell Mr. Roy Coons Jr. that your sister-in-law's husband, the detective, was telling you about the rape and strangulation and stuff like that? No, ma'am. Did the um, police ever give you any information um, immediately afterwards about what the cause of death was of the young girl down the street? No. Now, obviously, people speculate and things of that nature. Did you have your own speculations? Yeah. <laughs> but um, had you ever received any information other um, from any source, police source, that she had been strangled and raped? No. And you conveyed no such information to Roy Coons Jr.? No, ma'am. Do you see um, Roy Coons Jr. here in the courtroom today? Yes. Could you point him out for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? Sitting right over there. Let the record reflect that she has indicated the defendant. And did you know him? What name did you refer to him as? Ray. Okay. Little Ray. Little Ray. So he was known as Little Ray, but official name Roy Coons Jr. Right. Okay. Why was he called Little Ray? Uh, well, I had a friend that lived across from me, and she's the one who introduced me to her father, to his father, and called him Ray. Okay. And we just 
started calling him Little Ray and, you know, Mr. Ray. Okay. Now, when you were um, speaking with uh, Ray, Little Ray, at the door when you got home, mm -hmm. did he tell you, um, in addition to fixing your caulking, did he tell you anything about where he had been that day or what he had been doing that day? No, ma'am, just that he had worked on my copy. Do you remember him ever mentioning um, anything about going to a park? Uh, the next day he told me he went okay. to a park. Uh, take, take, he left my place to go take the dog to a park. Okay. So you two had a, had a conversation the next yes. day. Correct. And how did that come up? Uh, he came up to tell me about what had happened the night before. What, okay, what did he tell you the night before? Uh, about the, the police coming up and questioning him and um, what, you know. And where he had been? And where he had been. And, and uh, so we just got to talking about, and he was saying, you know, I was going to the park because that's the timeline that we all thought. Okay. And he said that he left, he went to the park before he came to meet with you or after he came to meet with you? After. Did he say why he went to the park? Uh, to walk his dog. Okay, just a moment, Your Honor. All right. Do you remember anything about um, what Ray Roy Coons Jr. was wearing when he came to your house on that day of August the 10th? Uh, he had on some silky basketball shorts, that okay. I call them. They're big and floppy. Mm -hmm. And a T-shirt. With the leaves cut out. Do you remember what type of footwear he had? He was barefoot. Thank you very much. Ms. Gray, you moved in to this, uh, this local park in 2014. Yes, sir. You have one roommate? Yes. And is that Ms. Claiborne? Yes. On the, you know, we're not asking where you were working, but you generally got off around 4, 4.30? Uh, yes, well, I'm working overtime. Okay. And then you, then you came straight home and you told us about driving around to avoid the sales. Right, yeah. Right, I understand. And uh, how long had you been home, you think, before Mr. Coons knocked on the door? Uh, maybe five minutes after I went in the house. Okay. And uh, the state's asked you about his appearance. There was nothing unusual. His no. He often dressed in shorts. Yes. And t-shirts and yes. shirts and things like that. Yes, sir. And he was often barefoot. Often yes, sir. And um, the conversation that you had, the first conversation you had right after you got home about the caulking, did, when you looked up, did it appear that it had been freshly caulked? It, it, you could tell stuff had been done. Okay. And you had no reason, based on your observations, to doubt that he had actually done that work there that day. Correct. But did you know what time he had done that work? No, sir, he didn't say. He just said he did it during the day. Was Ms. Claiborne home during the time he was doing the work? No. She wasn't home? No, no sir. Okay. And uh, had he done, you mentioned some of the other work he had done. From 2014 until 2017, had he done a, a fair amount of work around your mobile home? Well, basically it was just to remove some uh, shrubs out in front of my little deck and pressure wash and clean my deck and the awning underneath mm -hmm. and uh, mow my yard. Him and his father mow my yard. Do you know whether he did that kind of maintenance work throughout the mobile home park? Uh, I, I think he did. I know he did some work for the lady that lived across from me. And there was nothing unusual about his demeanor that day he came to get paid for the call? No, sir. Seemed like a normal conversation to you? Yes, sir. And then the next day he came, uh, at that point, is it fair to say that there was kind of a buzz and gossip around the neighborhood because something had happened the night before. Correct. And a lot of neighbors were out talking about it and calling and standing out in the yards and basically what's going on, that kind of thing. Right. And uh, you knew at that point, the next day, that there had been some allegations that a little girl had been killed. Correct. And you knew there were some allegations about kind of what maybe had happened to her. Well, from what we got from the news is that they they didn't have a visible explanation on the cause. Uh, were people wildly speculating about what may have happened? 
I don't know. I don't talk to other people in the trailer park, so I didn't talk to anybody else in the trailer park. Okay. And uh, after that point, so this would have been, I guess, August the 11th when you had this conversation mm -hmm. the next day. Did you continue to see Mr. Coons in the neighborhood throughout that time for a period of time? Yes, sir. And did he continue doing work around the neighborhood? Uh, he still, yes, sir. He still cut the yard. Still did work for you? Yes. The state was asking some questions about an aunt, or sorry, I'm sorry, not an aunt, a sister-in-law. Yeah. Do you have a sister-in-law? I have two sister-in-laws that are married to my brothers, but okay. they're not police officers. I don't talk to them very much. Um, we're not that close. Okay. And you're not connected to anybody with law enforcement? The only connection I have is a, a previous stepfather. Okay. Does he work for Metro Police? He, he was a Metro K-9. But he's been retired for 20 some odd years. Right. Not, I meant active. Long no, long. no. No one active. No, sir. Um, you seem to have a pretty good memory about that conversation with Mr. Coons on the 10th. Well, I had um, talked to the police officers twice, mm -hmm. and then the private detective for y'all. Mm -hmm. And. Um, kind of kept the pressure in mind. Yeah. Way. And plus, I still saw his father. His father still cuts my yard. And if you had noticed anything unusual about him that day, you would have remembered it based on this conversation? Correct. And you didn't? No, sir. No, no such observation? No, sir. That's all. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Moses, oh, oh, actually, Alexandra Hemingway. Good afternoon. If you could, please state your first and last name and spell them for the court reporter. Alexandra Hemingway. Okay, you need to get Scoot a little up. bit closer oh. to that microphone. Speak oh. up in a loud voice for me. we got to make sure everybody can hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you could, spell your first name for us. Alexandra. A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-A. -E and last name. Hemingway. H-E-M-I-N-G-W-A-Y. Ms. Hemingway, where, where are you originally from? Massachusetts. Okay. So um, speak up again in a loud voice for me. Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. Can you tell me when you came to Nashville? Um, July, in, probably like the end of July. And do you know what year it was? Uh, 2017. Okay. How did you come to Nashville? Me and my father, um, we were traveling, and um, our car broke down. Did your father have a health condition? Um, yes, he has diabetes. And how did that help um, end up with you being and staying in Nashville? Um, well, he had to go to the hospital, and then um, because of that, I didn't have anywhere to go because our car broke down. So um, I had to go to the mission, the women's mission. Okay. You were here with very little money at the time. Right. Be safe to say. Um, your, was your father hospitalized? Yes, he was. Do you remember what hospital he was at? Um, tr Trinity, uh, TRI, Trinity or something like that. Tri-Health maybe? Maybe, I'm not sure. Something that starts with the TRI? Yeah. Okay. And you said that um, you had to stay at the Women's Mission. Yes. And is that a place where people who do not have shelter can come and stay? Mm, yes. How long did you stay there? Uh, probably like three months, three months or so. At some point, did you meet an individual by the name of Moses, and I may not say it right, Okoth? Okoth. Okoth. <laughs> Moses Okoth. Yes. Did you meet that individual? Yes, I did. And where did you meet him? Um, at the library right in town. Okay, the downtown library? Mm -hmm. And um, did the two of you become friends? Yes, we did. Okay. 
And at some point, did you leave where you were staying at the mission and go live somewhere else? Yes. Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury about where you went. Um, I went to stay with him at the tent. It was, um, the mission was kind of overcrowded, so I just needed to get out. So I felt comfortable because he was nice and he showed me town and he showed me other areas and uh, resources that I could go to for help. Okay. So. And um, did uh, you and Moses Okoth um, also share um, a common interest in your faith, your religion? Yes. Okay. Could you describe where the campsite was where you went to live with Moses? Um, yes, it was located behind the TA truck stop. Would that be the TA truck stop mm -hmm. that's just outside those windows over yes. there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and is the camp very Can I get visible? You to speak up just a little bit? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is that campsite um, easily visible or is it somewhat hidden? It's hidden. Can you describe for me in a loud voice yes. where, <laughs> ha where and how it's hidden? Um, it's a lot of bushy areas, so it, it was in between the the gates and stuff where they would be doing uh, work on the, the um, train tracks. Okay. And um, how many people approximately, how big was this campsite? How many people were there? Um, probably two or three tents, and that, at least in that one little area. There was more, a little further away. Okay. At some point while you were um, there with Moses, did you... Were you introduced or did you meet an individual that you knew by the name of Ray? Yes, ma'am. Did you later learn what Ray's full name was? Yes, ma'am. And was that Roy Coons Jr.? Yes. Do you see that individual here in the courtroom today? Uh -huh. Yes. Can you point him out for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury? In the white, in the white shirt. Let the record reflect, Your Honor. She has identified the defendant. If you would, just... Tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the first time that you can remember meeting Ray. Um, met him uh, once, I think, once at the library. He was with Moses. Okay. And then at some point did he um, come to your campsite area? Um, I think he was already there prior to me meeting Moses. Okay. So he was already living there before you were living there. Um. Can you describe where Ray was living in relation to where you and Moses were living? Just a tent, tent uh, next to the other one. So you were next door neighbors, essentially. Basically. Okay. Um, now, in sometime after August tenth of twenty seventeen, um, did you have um, a an unusual? conversation or did Ray have unusual conversations um, or conversations with you about God? Um, well, I did um, hear him ask. Um, ask if if God would um, forgive someone for um, killing someone. And do you know who all was around when he asked that question? Just me and Moses. Just you and Moses? Um, did you answer him or did Moses answer him? I did. And what did you tell him? I said, yes, God would forgive you for your sins. And had you and Moses, um, were you open about your faith and your spirituality when you were around with Ray? Yes. So he would been, have been aware that you were a religious person. Yes, ma'am. Was that the only time that you heard Ray, as you, as you knew him, make any comments such as that? Can you repeat that one? Did you just hear him say that the one time? That I remember. That you couldn't specifically remember. Mm -hmm. Do you remember um, whether or not um, anything about when how Ray was acting before he left your camp? Um, I just, I just noticed he was, um, needed to get somewhere. He was, I don't know how to explain it, but, um. 
Well, let me back Maybe. it up. Had he, had he ever had any conversations with you and, and or Moses in your presence about um, whether he wanted to stay or whether he wanted to leave? Um, just how I heard him say, oh, I got to go, um, go to my dad's and then see you later or something. Or he might not see us again, I think he said. That came Were you ever back. present to hear him make any statements regarding California? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Could you share what those conversations or what those statements were about California? Um, he just asked if we would go with him and he was excited about it. He asked you to go to California with yeah. him? And what was your response? No. <laughs> if I can have just a moment, Your Honor. All right. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, Cross. Yes, Your Honor. Anyway, do you know the date that you met Mr. Coons? Um, had to be in September. Um, I can't remember exact day, but I know it was in September, towards the middle of September. Could it have been early October? Mm, could have. I'm not really sure. Maybe middle of Basically, you're saying you don't know when you met Mr. Kennedy. It's not remember. I can't um, record. Okay. You say you can't record. Do you have memory issues? I do a little bit. What What are those issues? Um, I've always had ADHD when I was younger, and um, um, for school, I always had bad. Um, I wasn't good in tests and stuff, so I couldn't re remember a lot while I was doing um, studying for classes and stuff. So, but. so this conversation you talked about about would God forgive someone if they killed someone? Do you know when that conversation happened? Um, um I know, I know it was it was in the car, and um, he was bringing us somewhere. Uh, we always needed a ride. He was um, able to give us a ride. So, um, so those those are the kind of conversations that about religion and God that you and Moses would have frequently. Um, at least the one that I remember, just a couple times that I remember. Um, not all the time, but maybe more for Moses. I don't know. But. So Moses would have conversations in your presence about God and. And sin. When he spoke about that, we answered him. The state asked if you were open about your faith. How, how are you open about that if you didn't have conversations about it? No, we had a conversation. It's just, um, I don't remember how many times he asked. All I remember is that, that, that one that really hit the spot when he asked about being saved um, or if he would be um, forgiven. And now you're saying that he would be forgiven, but a few minutes ago you said he asked the question if someone would be forgiven, not him. Are you talking about him? Are you talking He's, about him? He general? said it in general, but okay. I wouldn't. I didn't know at the time. I had no idea he was. That. So you don't know if he was talking about himself or just in general. Mm -hmm. Is that a forgivable sin? That's what I thought. Okay. So I didn't know him that you, well. You didn't take it to mean that he had killed him, right? Did. He and Moses eventually have a falling out. Mm, not sure what you mean by that. Was there a disagreement over money? Um, if there was, I can't remember that. Do you recall something about they were helping park cars and they were to provide money? And then... Um, that was when we were um, we were just helping when you know when the T I mean the um, stadium has a lot of people coming to town for football. We would help get some money to um, help people park their cars. Okay. So um, we were. Was there a disagreement over that? Splitting the money up? Yeah, the lady in the hotel um, 
I was getting mad at both of them for some reason. I don't know. I wasn't really right there. I was close by. Um, she obviously ticked them off, and then he got mad. And then I, I, all I saw was them getting mad about her talking to them. So you don't know so, the substance of that? Not fully. But after that time, did he and Moses part ways? Um... Uh, it seemed like it. I think that was a time when we we, we didn't see him again. But I can't remember. Right. And again, your memory though of the specific dates and times seems mm -hmm. a little fuzzy. fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And you can't accurately say when specific conversations happened and when you met people and when you stopped talking yeah. to people. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Doing the best you can, but you just don't remember. Yeah. That's all. Couple. Of yes, Your Honor. Mr. Hopkins talked about you not being able to remember, but one thing you kept saying was that you know that it was at least in September. Oh, and so. you are certain of that. Mm hmm Okay. Now, um, going back to the question that was asked about the disagreement and the lady that was at the stadium inn, mm -hmm. you were using words like, um, the lady was mad at both of them, and he got mad at her. Who was the he? Um, Ray. Ray? Yes. Ray got mad at her? How did Ray act? Um, angry. And so this disagreement, was it between Ray and the lady at the stadium inn? It must have. It, yeah, him and Moses, they just, something disputed and saw a rage come out. I don't know. Now, do you know, how did the, did you end up actually talking with the police at some point? Um, yes, they were just wondering um, what we were doing there. Okay, and do you, do you remember how you, where you met with the police and talked to them or how that conversation came about? Um, right, right where we were when flagging the um, people to park. And did you, um, are you and Moses still together? Um, we are. And do the two of you now share a child? Yes, we do. And do you now both um, have an apartment? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you ever receive anything from anybody for what you told the police? No, ma'am. Thank you. So the disagreement, it wasn't between Mr. Coons and, and Moses No, I'm not sure exactly, but I know the lady that was at the place, they were all yelling at each other because of, I guess, the, the situ, situation. Your and testimony here is you didn't have a disagreement with Mr. Coons over that money mm -mm, that I, he was owed for helping park. It was just them two. It was just those two? Yeah. And you and Mr. O'Connor are still living together as of today? Yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, sir. sir. <laughs> um, no, that's No, Your Honor. All right, thank you, ma'am. You're excused. We're going to take a 10 minute break. I'll have a break. Thank you. All rise. Yes. 